if you want to really understand drilling forces, drill something by hand, and you'll encounter all the weird pulling and twisting and torquing that drills undergo when they're spinning really, really fast. It's very educational. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. The burning heart of a steam locomotive is the coal fire, and the job of containing that raging inferno is left to the poor firebox. So I'm going to build a firebox for my Pennsylvania A3 switcher today. Should be fun. Let's go. Here's the outer crown sheet on the back as we left it last time. And if I take the back head off, you can see the big empty space in there where the firebox goes. That's what we're going to fill up today. Here is the back sheet and tube sheet for the firebox, and you can see how those are going to sit in there. I can kind of mock it up here. So the first job is to join them together with the firebox crown sheet. For that, I've got this big piece of copper here. This is actually all of the remaining copper from this project that I bought. So it looks like I calculated just about right for this. We're just about done, and I'm just about out of it. The process here starts as always. I mark out the piece a little oversized, cut it out on the bandsaw, and then clean up and square up all the edges on the mill. I won't bore you with the details here. If you want to see this process, watch the earlier videos in this playlist. Now I need to put a bend in this piece, so I'm going to start by annealing it, as has become tradition on this project. So I got the big torch out, and I heat up the piece until every part of it glows orange-red at least once. Then I let that cool down naturally. You can quench it if you want, but with a big flat piece like this, you risk warping it doing that. I also pickled it just to clean off the torch debris. Makes it a little more pleasant to work with. I've been doing that lately when I anneal things. Now I'm going to start by marking a center line and two equidistant layout lines on either side of it. These are the center of the curve I need to create and the tangent end point of the curve where it meets the straight sides of the firebox. Those side lines are one quarter the circumference of the circle away from the center. So these three lines are going to guide me as I roll the curve. At least, that was the idea. I'm going to try to do this in my slip roll. I've had pretty good luck with this machine on other boiler parts here so far. So the idea is to create a 180 degree curve centered on my center line there to form the arch that forms the crown sheet. So I've got my drive roller set and I'm putting some tension on that on the bending roller and away we go. As usual, I'm going nice and easy and taking my time here, trying not to go too far. On paper, this was a pretty good plan. Where it went astray, though, is that I didn't really understand where the actual bending moment on this machine is, so it was difficult to roll it back and forth and stop it exactly on the right place on my layout lines there to make sure the curve ends in the correct place on each side. I got about this far and realized things were going off course here. I got it a little bit crooked as well, as you can see, but that's easy enough to straighten out. The real problem is that the curve is not centered on the center line, which means that one side of it is now too short, and that's a problem. To fix this, I grabbed a piece of scrap out of the bin and turned it to the radius that I need on the lathe, and I'm going to use it as a hammer form. All these fancy tools, but honestly, hammer forming for me has just been the easiest and most reliable way to get the shapes correct on all these boiler parts. Good old hammer forming. So the hammer form allowed me to correct the position and shape of the curve at the top, and that was what was needed to kind of rescue this part. I did anneal it a couple more times during this process as well. Shifting the curve, though, messes up the straight sides, so now I need to fix those. I brought out the formers that were used to create the front and back sheets for the firebox. These are two material thicknesses smaller than the outer crown sheet needs to be, so I taped some material around the perimeter of the block there, and then I used that to kind of hammer form the straight sides and tune up the tangent areas there of the curve a little bit. I think I annealed it one more time during this process as well. It was getting a little springy there. After 40 minutes or so of heating and beating, I managed to get it into a decent shape here. So it's a pretty good fit now on the back sheet there, and it's long enough on both sides now. The piece is supposed to be over length on both sides so that you have room to trim. And then I tested the tube sheet as well. That's looking pretty good, so I think we can work with this. On to the next step then. There are some reinforcing ribs that go along the top of the crown sheet. I think these serve a dual purpose of reinforcing the flat area there, and I think they also serve to increase efficiency by conducting heat into the water. They kind of act as uh, reverse heatsink fins a little bit, I think. These are cut from copper bar stock. I just filed those to length to match the crown sheet there. 
The bar stock I have is too wide, so I put both pieces in the milling machine and narrow them up to the correct thickness here. While I'm making chips here, let's do a little steam engine 101. These ribs go on the crown sheet, and the crown sheet is actually what makes 90% of the steam in a boiler. The smoke tubes and all the other fancy looking stuff is really just optimizing around the edges. The overall horsepower of a boiler is determined primarily by the size of the grate, basically the size of the coal fire that it can hold. And then the crown sheet determines how efficient that boiler is at capturing the heat. So this little tiny two square inch crown sheet is where basically all of the horsepower is made. It's kind of neat. The drawing calls for a bevel on each end of these bars, probably mostly for style points, but perhaps also helps ensure that there's no clearance issues with the stay bolts and such inside the boiler. For these, I just measured and marked them, then used the fret saw to rough cut them and then filed them down to the layout lines. These pieces are going to live their entire lives inside the boiler where no one will ever see them, so it's really not worth setting up the milling machine and making everything perfect. But those came out pretty good actually, I'm pretty pleased with those. Now they go roughly here, but to get the positions just right, I'm going to do some layout. To start with, I need a center line down the middle of the sheet here. It would have been easier to do this before I bent it, but it's kind of good that I didn't since I got the bend in the wrong way anyway. The other center line that you saw me make is on the inside, so it's not useful here. Next, I went over to a piece of paper and a compass, and I plotted out the radius of the end of my part and some 30 degree angle marks there and that's going to allow me to line up where these bars go. I used this template to mark both ends of both bars, and then connected them together. And that gives me the 30 degree angle that these bars are supposed to be sitting at. Then over to the milling machine to drill clearance holes for 164 fixturing screws, the little brass screws that Kozo has you use for all these silver soldering operations. I just drilled these in reasonable places on the scribe lines. Doesn't really matter where they go because I'm going to transfer them onto the bars. So I clamp each bar in position, and then I use my scribe to just transfer those tiny holes onto the bars. I use those scribe marks to set the X position of the holes on the piece, but for the Y position I use the edge finder to center them up perfectly on the bars. These bars are not very much wider than these fixturing screws, so it's pretty important that the threaded holes be perfectly centered on the bars. Those were carefully tapped 164 and then I can attach the bars with the little brass screws, and that's going to hold them in place for soldering. That is looking pretty decent, so I think we're ready to make this permanent. Over to the hearth, after everything's been pickled, that includes all the copper pieces and all the brass screws, everything has to be pickled, and then I can assemble everything with flux in between everything, and the screws get fluxed as well, that's very important, easy to forget that, but if you don't do that then you won't get solder flowing through the screws and they will become leaks. Then I place some little pieces of solder in there, fire up the torch, and away we go. The real secret to success in silver soldering is placing the heat in the correct place for a given joint. Usually that is the far side of the joint from the silver solder. In this case that's really easy to do, as you can see here, I just heat from below with the solder on top, wait till it flows, and then use the Kozo scratch rod method to make sure I get a good fillet everywhere and that everything is covered. On some joints you can't heat the far side so conveniently like this and it's much more difficult. We've got a couple of those joints coming up so stay tuned. Those joints were easy though and so they came out great. In and out of the pickle bath and just clean off all the remaining soot there that's stuck in the joint. And we can do some inspection. These joints look really good. These are just mechanical joints. They aren't going to be leaks if there's anything wrong with them except for the brass fixturing screws. Those could be leaks, so I want to make sure there's solder fully through all the screws. And it looks like there is, so that's good. Now I can file off the screw heads here. I started out trying to do this with a round file because of the curve, and that just wasn't very easy, so I just switched to the Dremel and ground them off. They don't have to be perfectly flush as long as you mostly get rid of them. It's important not to remove any of the copper there. You don't want to weaken it. The next step then is to get the firebox back sheet in there. So I'm going to clamp it in place and try to get it aligned here before the once again obligatory brass fixturing screws are put into place. I clamped it all up and kind of tappy tap tapped everything until it was all square and seemed to be in a good position according to where the drawing says it's supposed to be. 
There was a little bit of eyeballing involved here. And this gets drilled and tapped for the 164 thread. Now with a setup like this where the pieces are clamped together during the drilling and tapping, you can see that I'm drilling and tapping through both pieces, which is not technically correct, but more on that in a minute. And yes, that stay bolt is off center. It was a mistake I made long ago, but it didn't actually matter because that position gets transferred into the back head, so it's guaranteed to line up. And two more fixturing screws are put in the sides. Then I come back with the clearance drill and I run it through the outer sheet just by hand. This is something that I've figured out along the way building this boiler that really helps fixture the pieces nicely because then the screw is actually clamping the pieces together. If you don't do that, you're trying to thread both pieces together and what tends to happen is the threads don't align perfectly the second time and it actually increases the gap between the pieces slightly, which is the opposite of what you want in silver soldering. So then the usual pickling, fluxing, placing the solder, heating from below, yada yada. And this joint was also quite easy because everything's pretty ideal here setup wise. Obligatory pickling and inspection now. So far so good. That joint looks really, really good from the outside. Got a nice fillet all the way around. I got solder through the fixturing screws. Here on the inside though, we have some trouble. There's a bit of a gap here that you can see. Even though there was a complete fillet on the outside, we don't know how deep that gap is, so the silver solder on the outside might be quite thin. I went back in and did another heating and fixed that, and I also recalked one of the fixturing screws that I wasn't very happy with. It didn't look like I had solder all the way through that one, so I just touched it inside and out with more solder, and that should be good to go. Those fixturing screws get clipped off and filed flush as usual. And that is the back half of the firebox essentially complete. So looking pretty good so far. Now onto the front half of the firebox, and for that we're going to need smoke tubes, or fire tubes, as they're sometimes called. So for that I've got this copper tubing here from McMaster for the purpose. These are pretty forgiving on length, so I laid them out with just a scale, some good light, and careful scribe marks. This should be accurate too, within a 32nd, hopefully a 64th if I'm careful. Then I cut the tube with a tubing cutter. If you wanted to be really, really fussy about these, you could cut them over length with the tubing cutter and then face them down on the lathe on both ends, but that just really isn't necessary. Those get deburred inside and out on both ends, and now I want to check the fit. From my experience with building stationary boilers, I know that fire tubes have a very specific fit that they should have. It's what I call the drop-through test. Well, actually, I didn't name that. That's from a famous boiler building book that I've talked about before. Essentially, the tube should fall through under its own weight, which is about a 2 thou clearance. I wound some rings of silver solder using an offcut of the tubing there. I should have used something smaller actually. Silver solder is very stiff and has a lot of spring in it, so it's actually not very easy to shape it. But then everything gets pickled of course, and I set it up in the hearth here like this for soldering. The front tube sheet at the bottom there is just being used as a jig to hold everything straight and in alignment. Then my little rings of silver solder go on there, and I can start heating. That drop-through test, by the way, is a little bit more clearance than you might use for other types of joints in boilers. My experience has been that with tubes you want a little bit more clearance, like 2 thou instead of 1 thou. The reason being that tubes tend to expand more when they heat than the sheets that they're in do. And so if you're not careful, the tube will expand and tighten up the joint too much and prevent the solder from flowing through it. For all these firebox joints, especially the tubes, I'm using the Harris Safety Sill 56, which is a higher heat range solder than the cadmium stuff. And that's because these joints are at risk of damage from future soldering operations in this area, so I thought the higher heat range might be good here. And the Harris is also better at gap filling, which is really helpful on some of these parts where my gaps aren't perfect. So inspection on the tube joints now. Those look really, really good. I got a really nice fillet all the way through both sides of the joint. And this is super critical, not just because these are important joints, all the joints are important on a boiler, but these joints are going to be completely inaccessible when the boiler is assembled. So they are impossible to fix if the boiler fails a pressure test. So these joints absolutely have to be perfect before you move on. I mean, that's arguably true of all the joints, but it's especially true on these joints because they are literally impossible to fix. So if they leak when the boiler is done, the boiler is probably scrap. I'm really happy with those joints though, I feel really good about them, so I'm going to move on to attaching the front half of the firebox to what we just built earlier in this video. Once again, double checking my fit. This step is really important, and it's one that I should have spent a little more time on every time I do one of these, 
which is to get the clearances just right. Getting some light in there is really helpful for checking the clearances. Ideally, you want little or no light visible anywhere around the joint. That's going to be a one thou clearance, which especially for the cadmium silver solder is really important because it's very, very bad at gap filling. And that can be tricky with these hammer formed parts to get the clearances that tight, but you got to do the best you can. Over to the milling machine then for the obligatory fixturing screws. I'm using the calipers there to measure the overall length of the firebox to make sure it matches the drawing. That's important because this sets the distances between the tube sheets and the fire tubes and the back head and so on. I also want to make sure that the tubes look straight and that the tube sheet is square to the firebox. Once I'm happy with everything, then I can go ahead and start drilling these screws. The nice thing about this assembly now is that it's sufficiently internally structurally sound that it can handle the drilling just by being clamped to the table like this. In the earlier stages of some of these boiler parts, it's quite difficult to drill these holes when the parts are all spindly and complicated shapes that are hard to fixture and so on, as you saw earlier in this video series. But once again, there's three screws in these parts, one at the lower corner and then one in the top center. And as before, because these pieces are being drilled and tapped together, then I come back afterwards and remove the threads in the outer sheet with a clearance drill so that the fixturing screws will actually clamp the pieces together and not just be awkwardly parallel threaded and have an uneven gap. I'm almost ready to solder this now, but I still wasn't very happy with the gaps that I had. I could see some light in places where there shouldn't be light. So one thing that can help is clamps because the copper is annealed from all of the soldering and the, well, annealing and so on. So everything is really soft. So it's pretty easy to just kind of squish things together if you need to. So I did some overall clamping as you see here. And another technique I've had good luck with is using a big C clamp to kind of reach in there and squeeze the flange together with the sheet. You do get a little bit of spring back with this, but this can really help improve joint clearances quite a bit. I still had mixed feelings about this joint, but at some point you just got to give it a shot and hope for the best. So over to the hearth after pickling, of course, and prepare everything with flux and get all the fixturing screws in place and so on. This part of the process can be pretty tricky because the screws are difficult to thread when they're covered in flux and the pieces want to move around and you're smearing flux everywhere. So it can be pretty messy, but with a little bit of practice, you can get the hang of it. And then I place the silver solder on there. You can see that the shape of the solder there doesn't follow the curve very well because the silver solder, as I said, is very stiff and has a lot of spring and it's fairly difficult to shape. It's not like electrical solder, but I did the best I could. For heating this joint, Kozo recommends heating the outside of the crown sheet as I'm doing here, kind of down low, just letting the heat rise up into the joint from below rather than heating from the inside as you might expect, which would be an easier way to get a good joint. I think Kozo suggests not doing that though because of the risk of overheating the tubes. That's a distinct risk here. It's in fact because of this risk that on this joint I'm using the lower melting point cadmium based silver solder. Using the higher heat range on the tube joints hopefully will protect those joints a little bit when I go to do this joint. Kozo does not say that this is necessary but I think it can't hurt because again if we damage those tube joints and they leak and the final boiler is assembled we can't fix them and well the boiler is scrap. I wasn't feeling great about this joint. I had difficulty wrangling the silver solder. You can see how it's running down the sides there a lot. It wasn't well positioned on the joint, but we'll see how it did here. And yeah, sure enough, on the inside of the joint here, I've got big gaps all over the place. That's just really not a good looking joint. From the outside, I got a decent looking joint around the top here. That was nice and tight. But down the sides there where the solder was poorly positioned and my gaps were a little bit worse, you can see that I just really didn't get any good fillet there at all. Once again, you can see here what happened. The solder mostly ran down the outside of the shell, and that's why it didn't go in the joint and why there's very little in that joint. Really just not a good technique on my part there. But I went back and did a second heating, exactly the same as you saw, but I was a lot more careful about how that solder was sitting on the joint before I heated it, and that made all the difference in the world. Now I've got a really nice look and fillet all the way around the inside, and the screws look better. They got more solder in them. And around the top here, really nice visible fillet all the way around. No gaps or anything there at all. So very pleased with that. It also looks like the tube joints survived. They seem just as good as they were. We won't know for sure until the pressure test, but I feel pretty good about that. I got this joint done with minimal heating around the outside of it there. And once again, all the screws got soldered through them, so those look good.
So as per usual, the screw heads get filed flat. The screws get clipped flush on the inside. And then the last step to do with this firebox is to bring the sides of the crown sheet down flush with the front and back of it there, make it all flush and square on the bottom. The crown sheet is intentionally made a little bit oversized so that when you put the curve in it, you don't have to be exactly perfect with that because that's very, very difficult to do. I started with a coarse file and then finished up with a smooth file just to make that a little bit nice. I don't need deburring yet, but everything's flat and square there. Something else interesting is visible in this shot here. You see how that solder is running down the inside there? That's what happens if your joint is a little bit too big with the cadmium silver solder. It flows right through the joint. So you can see all the little places where my gap wasn't quite perfect. And this is part of why I like the Harris actually better for most boiler joints because it's way better at gap filling. It doesn't do this running through the joint business like the cadmium stuff does. But the way the cadmium stuff flows makes it really nice for complex joints and it makes really nice small fillets. So you need less heat and less of the solder to fill joints and to get complex joints fully soldered. So I kind of like having both in my toolbox. They both are good at different things. There's the completed firebox. I'm pretty pleased with how that came out. I'm feeling good about all those joints. I'm debating whether to pressure test this firebox now. It's a single standalone assembly that could be pressure tested by itself before I install it inside the main boiler as you see here. So I'm thinking about that, we'll see. But I'll mock it up here with the back head as you can see there. That's how that's gonna go together. That back head joint is gonna need some work as you can see. But uh, you can sort of see how all the pieces fit together. And then the tube sheet will go on the front like that. And the smoke tubes there open up into the smoke box to let the smoke out the chimney. It's really looking like a boiler now. We've got the two major assemblies complete. And the next series of operations are going to be joining the two halves together, which there's a lot of fairly intricate work to make all that happen. But stay tuned for all that. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons who make all this content possible. And I'll see you next time.